Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, it's great to be back in Chicago. Thank you all so much. Um, it looks like an auditorium, but it's a church. <laughs> and the way you know it's a church is because of that echo, <laughs> that booming sound, which reminds you that your soul is in peril. I also associate church with struggling to stay awake. <laughs> and I think the echo is also part of that. There's that reverberant acoustic which covers you like a cocoon. Um, I'm going to read a couple of pages from Tremor. They're not representative of the book, and it's hard for me to find a passage that's representative of a book that's making a number of different stylistic gestures, but in any case, we'll start with the words. I wouldn't set it up at all, but we'll just, we might address what it is later. I studied finance in Lancashire and worked in banking in the oil and gas sector in the UK for some years, in Preston first and then in London. Then I came back to Nigeria and did the same thing here through the 90s and early 2000s. I made good money. Now I make even better money in my car importation business. So you could say I've had a normal life, a successful but normal life. But people are curious and they have tried to explain what they see as my one strange habit. There must be something abnormal about the guy, you know. Some spread the story that my wife died young and that this is why I started my annual thing. But my wife is alive, the children are there, and I am, perfect, and I am a perfectly ordinary husband and father. Some others call what I do performance art, but to me it's not art and I'm not an artist. And of course, many say it's morbid. Ignoring death is what I find morbid because Death is right here. The Sahara aspect of it is important because for a man my age, when my funeral comes, it's going to be a celebration. That is how it is in our culture. I'm not old yet, but by any measure, I've lived a life. So I rehearse the funeral that way. I envision it as the funeral of someone whose life is worth celebrating. We put up tents, rent chairs and tables, and provide food for the whole neighborhood. All kinds of people come, and though the adults are both fascinated and skeptical, the children are simply happy to be there. Everyone eats and drinks, and while they do so, I'm upstairs in the parlor, dressed in a full suit, sealed in my casket for the duration of the Sahara. What I am doing is preparing for the inevitable day, I am not interested in avoiding the inevitable. I don't want to come to that day without having prepared myself for it. I ordered the casket from New Jersey new, eight years ago. It is made of bronze, burnished a deep brown with copper escutcheons and fittings. It is lined with cotton, satin, and velvet. I find myself really looking forward to the hours I get to spend in there for one day each year. When I'm in the casket, I am immersed in a darkness unlike the darkness of night or sleep. This is a very deep, padded darkness, and the feeling it brings is one of peace. The casket is set up upstairs, and because it has some tiny air vents, I can faintly and intermittently hear the Sahara going on downstairs. The sound seems to be coming not from outside, but from inside. The first time it happened, I was mystified and a little scared. Only later did I realize that what I was hearing was the sound of my own blood circulating through my body, the blood in my own head. I was hearing in a way I hadn't heard before, the sound of myself being alive.
That was so nice to get to hear you read that out loud. And listening to you read the rehearsal for death makes me want to start with um, a question about authenticity and what you see as the relationship between truth and beauty. There's a moment actually earlier in the novel where uh, Tundi wonders what authenticity means. Uh, you write that this particular chihuahua has been danced in a Bambara agricultural festival, or that whether or not it was danced, it was made for the tourist trade, that it was made by Bambara people for the use of Bambara people. Mm. Um, and in a later moment, you write that space travel was so real that it lost its magic. Mm. So I was curious to hear you talk about the relationship between truth and beauty, what you see as authenticity, and whether things can be so real that they lose their magic. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I was wondering on the technical side of things, it does seem extremely reverberant in here, doesn't it? Could you hear her question clearly? You could, okay, maybe it's clearer over there and it's the preacher who can't hear <laughs> what is being said. Um, okay, as long as you can hear us, we are good. Um, <clears throat> yeah. It's a, it's, it's, it's a fraught question. This is a novel that is quite close to the consciousness of this narrator. Sometimes he's the narrator, sometimes he's merely the protagonist being narrated from the outside. Um, and one of the things he keeps thinking about is that what do you do with the given when they tell you that here is what the real thing is and here's the thing that is not the real thing. So he thinks about that with um, reference to this sculpture that he sees, which seems to be an actual sculpture made in Mali, but it's not very expensive, and he wonders why. Um, and so he goes down these thoughts of, well, here in the West, if it's African art, that's not enough. What it needs is, prov is provenance. It needs a long trail of words like uh, where it was collected and who, you know, who used it in what ritual. Um, and other art made by other African artists in the same milieu. I mean, you could buy a Chiwara sculpture from Mali for $300,000 or you could buy one for $200,000, depending on who has decided that, you know, it's worthy of being auctioned at Sotheby's. And if it has been collected by an eminent white collector, then it becomes more valuable. So he's, he's thinking through these thoughts. And I think one of the counterpoints to that in the book is that Tunde, the pro protagonist, goes to Mali and thinks about what does it mean to be close to the lives of others, to their worlds. What does it mean to try to see the lives of others on their own terms, not simply as a matrix for your own tourism? And then there's an inflection of that when he goes to Nigeria, which is where he's from. Again, that we're always simultaneously inside and outside the realities of others. That's a totally beautiful response. And actually, that combined with your thinking about the church and the echo and the preacher calls to my mind um, a moment in an interview with James Baldwin from uh, the Paris Review Art of Fiction series in like 1980, where he's talking about the difference as he sees it between preaching and writing. And he basically says, when you're preaching, you already have reached the conclusion, and you assemble your congregants and you convey to them the conclusion you've reached, but that when you're writing, it's the opposite that you don't know what you're finding and you don't want to know in many cases. And for me, one of the oxygenating forces of this book and of the way that you answer questions is constant source of wonder mm. or wonder as the engine of mm -hmm. fiction or something. Absolutely. And so I wonder for you what the central questions are, what your core questions are, and whether that asking is part of the reason for the roving kaleidoscopic mm -hmm. POV of the book. I mean, that's, I think that's exactly the heart of it because this is a character who potentially could be open to the critique of sharing a lot of our political positions. Um, and usually we want a fictional character to be more fractious, 
to be more disagreeable. He's somebody who thinks politically a lot, and yet there might be many of you who read the book and say, yeah, I essentially broadly agree with him politically. Um, but I hope the book doesn't stop there, but it actually becomes this sort of like open text that's always asking the margins of, well, what are the bases of the things that are believed? And how can they always be revised? And it is that constant revision. It's not, because one of my frustrations with a lot of contemporary fiction is that it also has a lot of doubt about starting from where we are and seeing that as a worthy subject. Um, I have read reviews of books, especially written by diasporic Africans, where the critic will say something like, and it is when she goes to Ghana that the book become, really comes alive. Yeah, like, you know, because when she was in San Francisco, who wants to hear about her job there? Yeah, and, and, and this is, I mean, you might have seen this sort of trope, like this idea that it is the foreign and exotic locale that is the true matrix for um, creative work, especially if you have some connection to that place. And I want to say, no, wherever you are, there's everything to play for, and there's always something at stake. There are places that offer you more melodramatic situations. Certainly, Lagos, Nigeria is a place that is full of everyday melodrama. But you know, this character lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it, it, for me, it's a problem if we pretend that there oh, well, since there isn't a lot of street crime there and things appear to be orderly on the surface, there's nothing to interrogate in a life that is there. I think there's always something to interrogate. Um, and there's always something to interrogate in oneself. One's political alertness to the world is never a settled thing. Um, yeah. I think that's very clear in the book. And the attentiveness is, is part of the beauty of it, a kind of very, very acute watchfulness and a, and a threading uh, through the novel of all the things that we, that we see and the things from which we avert our eyes. And I wonder there too, I mean, maybe this is a little bit more of a craft question, but how you think in your own work about sort of the integration of research and imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where does fiction come from? It's the invented, the overheard, the remembered, the dreamed. You know, and all of that is somehow stitched together into, into what we then call, um, what we call fiction. So, um, and I guess the idea is to make the weave in such a way that it becomes an invitation to the reader to step into a world that is coherent in its own right. Yeah. Or even where it isn't necessarily coherent in a sort of linear way or a narrative way, right. it's kind of the juxtaposition of the banal and the profound Precisely. makes the thing feel real. Precisely, yeah, exactly. Not coherent in, oh, this is what I expect a novel to be, but to actually say inside the word novel is the promise of newness. Yes. And that is how it started. And then we've sort of strayed away from that. And now it's a genre. And you can go to the airport and pick up a novel and know what you're going to get. It's a novel. <laughs> We're making novels without novelty. And it has become an expected thing. And for me, I mean, this is why it's taken me so long to make us... <laughs> The last novel I wrote was 12 years ago. Um, it takes a long time to figure out what is the new thing I want to say in this form. So there was, there was a search for form. And yet, within that rather fractured formal uh, structure, it definitely has a lot of structure. It doesn't have plot. It has a lot of structure. But within that, the world of the novel, within those two hardcovers, is a world. And for me, everything in that world is intentional, even if it's all being evoked from different modes of address. Uh, one of the things in this book, it has eight chapters, and almost every 
chapter takes a different approach. So it, uh, I'm like a third person, first person, uh, a series of first persons, and then, you know, another third person narrative interspersed with a second person that interrupts from not every now and again. So there are all these, to me, they feel like a bunch of handheld cameras yeah. rather than a fixed talk. A lot of novels are like a fixed talking head camera. Yeah. That's true. I mean, that's why I described it as kaleidoscopic. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because the effect of it in a way is like, I mean, maybe this is presumptuous, but it feels like a guided tour of your imagination. It feels like a generous book to me in that respect. Um, and the, the fragmentary nature of the sections, although I would say not the prose, mm -hmm. is something um, that creates a little bit of friction. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit, it's a, it's a bit scratchy. It's a little bit of a conundrum because it's not unfair to call it experimental. I, yeah, I haven't used that word. I probably wouldn't use that word. Every I novel I is an use experiment. That word. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And also, even if it is, let's say, structurally unusual, yeah. it's easy to read. Yes, that's true. That's, Compelling, you might say. Propulsive. It's, it's, well, I don't know about propulsive, but it's, I just write, I mean, you heard it. I write pretty straightforward sentences. Yes. You know, so the, maybe the experimental part is, um, wait, where are we now, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I don't, I, in Open City, I really wanted to make something that felt like you, were, you had been put into a boat and pushed, and because of prevailing winds, you were able to just sort of glide in that boat across a lake. And in this case, I was interested in discontinuity that was still complete. And that was a, ch a challenge. Um, that there are these sleights of hand you can use to transition and smoothen things out. And I wanted to see how much of that I could get away with not doing. Yeah. To sort of cantilever the structure of the thing with no apparent columns. And yet it's staying up because of going too far into this architectural metaphor. <laughs> but, you know, there's iron bars inside the concrete so the cantilevered roof comes all the way out. And you're thinking, how can that stand up? There's no columns. So I wanted to do that. There are also poetic threads which you pull up to the surface and then weave through. I didn't notice, for example, until you read that section out loud, that he hears his own blood in the coffin rehearsing his death. And then, of course, there's that very beautiful moment at the end. It's kind of a spoiler, but not really, mm -hmm. where he's listening for her blood under the skin of her wrist. That's right. Um, yeah. And it's sort of like expansion and contraction or something, contracting into the coffin and his own body and vessels That's and right. rhythm. And then at the end, almost like an opening up by way of connection to another human being. Absolutely. And I mean, about maybe four different times in the novel, there is, in completely different contexts, this idea of the secrecy of the blood that's moving through your body. And it's something that gets evoked. And for me, that is one of the keys to structure. Yeah. Uh, in the absence of plot, what you now have is motifs that show up. And for me, that's one of the differences between a novel and a transcript. Um, because if you just did a transcript of daily life, it would not have this intentional order of things that show up in a kind of a secret rhythm. And this book for me, I mean, it's, it's, com it's totally full of that. It's, it's um, uh, novelists essentially have a kind of paranoid imagination, right? A, a novel is a little world that says, everything is connected, check it out, you know? Well, in real life is not really like that. Everything is connected in real life, but on such a massive scale that nothing is connected. But in a novel, since you have a very constrained scale, your choices of what recurs and what connects to what 
what happens on page 17 and is echoed on page 150, because you've intentionally done that in a small space, that echo becomes audible. So it's, it's, it's not paranoid, but it's, if you do it in real life, it's paranoid. If you do it in a novel, it's art. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hearing you say that also makes me think, in a way, we make too rigid a fuss about genre. Yeah. And that, in fact, that's true for nonfiction, too. And it's true yeah. for poetry. Yeah. And that what you do is you take an enormous amount of material, whether it's imagined or read or dreamt or lived, and then you try yeah. to make meaning of it. And that's in order it. to make meaning, you have to make patterns. Yeah. I'd rather look at a constellation like the one that you've made yes. and described than a super labored plot where everything is tacked down. Right. OK, but I want to ask you about violence. <clears throat> and like difficulty, trouble, basically. I was thinking, reading this, um, Edwidge Danticat, whom I love, came to UChicago recently. Edwidge? Edwidge. Yes. And I asked her about the difference writing violence in nonfiction and fiction. And her answer really surprised me because basically what she said was that when you're writing nonfiction and you write scenes of violence, I mean, it was really a question about how do you write violence without enacting it mm -hmm. or without you know, exploiting it. Right. And she said in nonfiction, you have an obligation to do it as graphically as you can because it happened to someone. Mm. But in fiction, you kind of have to dim the lights. Mm. And I'm just curious how you think about writing, you know, brutality and violence. There's murder in the book. There's, you know, there's mm. a certain level oh, yeah. of chaos yeah. having to do with the body. Yeah. And I wondered how you calibrated that. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting answer that Edwidge Danticat gave. Um, so you, you're graphic with it in real life, and then in fiction you mute it. Um, I'm team mute, you know. I, I like to, I think it's important to talk about it, to admit of its presence, to think about it, but describing it in a fun and entertaining way is not really my thing. So that when it does show up, it has real visceral effect um, due to its scarcity. Um, I mean, I, I grew up in Nigeria. I was born in the U.S. and I came back to the U.S. quite a long time ago now, 1992. So, um, I'm American. And like any good American, I'm very critical of America. One of the things that really gets to me is the role violence plays in culture here and how violence is one of the central modes of entertainment. Um, both things that are not serious, like Marvel, and things that think they're serious, but they completely disempower their own narratives because the moment a horror becomes an entertainment, I really disliked Schindler's List. It doesn't work. You can't do that with that. And it was just sentimental and violent. Um, I think when you take on a subject like that, what you really need is a lot of withholding and confrontation. But when you just turn it into another big budget movie with a saccharine soundtrack. And then there's that one little girl's dress that's pink on the black and white scene. No. So um, I want to think about the inheritance of violence in a way that does not stop being shocked, that does not stop being distressed by it, that is somehow perpetually distraught by it because it is distressing. Um, the shock of history cannot fully be absorbed and the work I, 
My ambition is to make work that refuses to absorb what cannot be absorbed. I think it's beautiful and reassuring, and I think it's not the domain of writers and artists to simplify. This is one of the problems with social media, right? There's poetic efficiency or lyrical compression of ideas, which is a beautiful thing. But then there's the compression of, of content which requires nuance and full examination. And so social media doesn't lend itself to this kind of thing, and conversation does, and human connection does. Which leads me to welcome you all to join this conversation. This is one of the most democratic books in its way. It's not just a chorus of voices, it's about the difference between alienation and human connection, if I do say so, yourself. Um, do you wanna invite questions? I yeah, I mean, I think, mode. I love, oh, the word democratic. You know, what that means is that half of the people who read it are gonna hate it. <laughs> that's, that's democracy, right? And then um, a bunch of those who li like it are gonna just like it because the more progressive candidate has no chance of winning the general. What a, wait, where are we going with this? So, um, my publicist gets really nervous when I start talking like this. Like, you should tell people to buy the book. I'm like, nah, the book will wait. Don't worry about it. Um, so, this is supposed to be Q&A, but, and you know what they always say, questions please, no comments. Actually, I like comments. Um, I mean, questions if you must. I'm not an oracle. But if you have a succinct, thoughtful comment responding to something we've talked about, I would like to have your voice as part of the conversation. Um, being on stage is weird. We're all thinking together. So a question or a comment. Good afternoon. Um, I first learned of you through the column you wrote for the New York Times on photography. And I'm wondering, based on how you've uh, talked about the book, um, if your writing and the way you used photography has informed your perspective as you articulated this, um, the scenarios in, in the book. Yeah, and I think the, the deeper I go into my work as the years pass, the more information sharing there is between different parts of my practice. So that as a novelist, I'm learning a lot from the nonfiction I write, I'm learning a lot from the photography I do. And all of those other things, even in the photography, I think my photos look like the photos of a writer. It's hard to put into words exactly why, but they're kind of thinky. Um, but I think that all of this is connected to something I'm always telling my students, which is that your work is not just its craft. Your work comes out of the person that you are. So it's about showing up for the work um, in a way that you're showing up with yourself and all the things you are now. Each art form has its own affordances and you need your technical skills in all of those things. There are technical skills involved in making a novel and they're quite different from what is involved in writing a newspaper column. And yet nevertheless, the you that's making that work always has to be you. And um, I think there's a continuity that's been emerging for me. You are multi-hyphenate yourself. Do you find this integration is happening? That was such a generous and beautiful answer, and it reminded me of um, my original question. You've brought it beautifully full circle. The question about research and imagination, mm -hmm. and that makes me think that you're also giving your students permission to imagine their own lives as research. Yeah. What you look at, what you attend to, you know, to what sounds you're actually paying attention, Absolutely. What, what you're thinking about, what interests you, what drives you, video games, you know, all the things, and you pull so many of those things in. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I write across the genres, and part of my own thinking and wondering often has to do with what, what shape does this question naturally take? Exactly, yeah, the, the search for form. What must will be, be least of... artificial? How can I try to be honest? That's right. Yeah, thank you, sir. Got another question yeah. for you over here. 
Hi there. Hello. Um, I'm just meeting you today in your writing. I'm looking forward to reading your book. I was drawn to this because of the topic of violence in writing. And I just wanted to ask you, I teach fourth, fifth, and sixth grade writing and integrated social studies. I'm a Montessori teacher. And my curriculum always tends to really focus on what's really happening in the world. And I get a lot of criticism for that. So this year we're doing refugees. We're talking about you know, boat refugees and all of these topics. And I, I think that it's important to protect innocence, but also that the violence of the world, children need to study it very young because there are very young people in the world who are experiencing it. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, oof. It's that thing where I'm about to say something controversial. Um, speaking from my deep expertise as somebody who doesn't have children, <laughs> sometimes I'm out in the city and I'm like, wow, small human beings, great. I had forgotten. Um, <laughs> And apparently some of you just have them in your house all the time. <laughs> really, it's two worlds. Um, I do think that we should allow violence to be integrated into the lives of children in a more healthy way. I think there's, there's a tendency here to shield and protect, and it is part of the larger tendency to falsify, and I don't think it necessarily makes for humane citizenship. Um, after all, just based on military activity alone, this is the most violent country in the world, but it is also like the most pearl-clutching. Um, and we never want to see animals killed, but we all eat steaks. Um, so I think kids going hunting is fine. I think, you know, going hunting is better than video games. Video games is fine too. I think that there shouldn't be so much censorship on TV. What there should be is candor about what is this and what role does it play in life. But what we just do is more like shielding um, because I think the key question is not just, is there violence in the world, but to develop our citizenship in a way that leads us to naturally ask, how am I violent? Where is my violence? But when we do this kind of like hiding it and hiding it and hiding it, and the ultimate of that is now, you know, we do drone warfare. And so we kill thousands of people without losing a single pilot. Um, I think that's the natural conclusion of the American approach to violence, which is, I don't want to see it, let it happen. Um, please don't take child raising advice from me. <laughs> like, I see my nephews two times a year. Um, but having been a child once myself, you know, or just speaking from that position, um, we were not excessively shielded. Um, uh, yeah, I think there's too much coddling somehow. I don't know. You compare toddlers in the novel to convicts. Yes. <laughs> you know how little kids walk along holding a rope together? So that's the commercial spin on that comment. Listen, there's darkness everywhere. I did not, I didn't invent this. I report, you decide. Do those, do those little toddlers have real freedom? I don't know. The wheels of the bus go round and round. It's kind of ominous. It's... Excellent. I have our next question back here. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Susan, and I'm um, a student with the Odyssey Project. So, 
thank you, the humanities. <laughs> My grandmother was born in Poland, Warsaw, during the pogroms. And my great-grandmother put her and her sister into a convent to keep them safe. So my little Jewish grandma was raised mainly by nuns. Okay, so you talked about Schindler's List and not to give a movie critique of it, but I never knew that story. I knew the stories of the atrocities, but I never knew about Schindler and what he did during the war until that film. And for me, the most powerful part of the film was like the epilogue, seeing this, mm. all, all the generations that were here because of what he had done. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's really important to remember that in the midst of horrible evil, that there's still some good. Yeah. That's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I agree. It's a, very, it's a very important story. The stories have to be told. Um, it's a very important story. And I also agree about the, the, those last few minutes you're talking about, which are, it's actually real life footage of people who have now become elders, who had their families, they tried to destroy them, but now they have flourished and they have these large clans. But it's interesting that that itself is more powerful than the entire feature film, because there's something about it that is true. But it's not the true, it's not the fact that it's documentary, it's the fact that it does not have the failures of of a Hollywood, I'm not going to die on this hill. People are. <laughs> I, it's like, dude, choose your moment. <laughs> Is this the, really the time to like rail against Schindler's List? <laughs> are you really that eager to get canceled? <laughs> what are we doing here? Come on. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry. This will be our last question, folks. As a reminder, there will be a book signing immediately following the program on our first floor of Tasha Cole's book, Tremor, a novel. And here's our last question. I hope it's a good one. Since you said cancel, you don't want to get canceled, I was at the cancel culture um, lecture that we had here a couple weeks ago. And since you're with young adults, forget the little kids, yeah. I have three young adults, um, and you're talking about social media, I would love to your, your thoughts and input on, are you seeing a change in the generation that you are teaching? I mean, I felt like they're petrified of this whole cancel culture, and you can't be different. You have to be the same. And it's really hard, whereas when I went to school, it, it was your right to be different. And so our, what does it take for this current generation to say, the heck with social media, this is not, this is not right. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I do teach people from the age of 18 upwards. I have undergrads, I have graduate students. <coughs> and if each generation has its own stuff that it's figuring out, and this generation has to deal with a social compact that is collapsing as well as a future that looks quite dark and quite grim. Um, not, none of that is their fault. Um, we are leaving them a world that is deeply insecure. That would make anybody anxious. I think the real trouble with cancel culture is that the New York Times runs so many opinion pieces about it, <laughs> usually from uh, middle-aged white people who are freaking out because they think everything is mostly fine and why do people feel so strongly about things. Yeah, there's probably a conversation to be had about real anger about even having to think about what are the structures of injustice that constitute our world and how dare people demand for things to be different or how dare people ask to be treated with 
dignity and true inclusiveness. Um, I think it's disgraceful how worried older people are by cancel culture. It's disgraceful. It's a disgrace. It's like, show some respect for yourself. There are real problems in the world. I don't want to read another op-ed about this stupid subject. <laughs> there are real problems in the world. Um, and it is remarkable that it's precisely those people um, who don't have anything edifying to say about what's going on right now in, in the Middle East. So, turns out they've been acting in bad faith the entire time, but we knew that. So, I mean, not uh, strong opinions. It feels like a pity to leave it there, but somehow that's how it is sometimes. You guys have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. <laughs>